I think we can start. Those who hasn't uh, managed to join us will join us soon. Once again, I would like to welcome you all at this press conference of the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations on Human Rights in Belarus, Anais Maran. The speaker will present to you the new report dedicated to Belarusians who had to leave the country and cannot um, safely return to the country due to the violation of human rights in Belarus. My name is Natalia Kandievska. I represent the Belarusian Press Club and I'm moderating today's session. A few points over before I give floor to the speaker, our working languages today are English, Russian and Belarusian. The speaker will be presenting in English. Other participants can ask questions in English, Russian or Belarusian. We work with the interpreter. The press conference will last about one hour. First, Ms. Anais Marin will present a report, then there will be a Q&A session. You can ask your questions in any of the working languages in the chat. During the presentation, please turn off your microphones. This will help to avoid additional interference. Now I'll give floor to the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations on Human Rights in Belarus, Ms. Anna Ismaran. Natalia, I will speak in English indeed. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Press Club Belarus for um, inviting me today. Uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to uh, also discuss with the, the media about my work and about the, the latest report, which I presented yesterday night to the General Assembly in uh, New York online. First, uh, allow me to remind a couple of things about the mandate itself so that you might understand why I may not necessarily answer all the questions you may have. Um, first, the, I operate within the framework of a resolution, which is renewed at each year by the UN Human Rights Council, and which lists very precisely what are my duties and my prerogatives. Um, the um, special rapporteurs are part of what is called the special procedures of the Human Rights Council. Uh, it's a body of independent experts, um, and um, independent uh, fact-finding or monitoring uh, mechanisms that are meant to address uh, specific country situations, like in the case of Belarus or other countries, Mali, uh, Syria, North Korea, um, or thematic issues. And here there are some 60 other um, uh, mandate holders on specific human rights, international, internationally guaranteed uh, human rights. Uh, we perform our work on a voluntary basis, uh, meaning that we are not UN staff, we do not receive a salary for our work, and whatever we say is in our independent capacity, meaning that um, it doesn't engage the responsibility of the UN. However, to make sure that we don't uh, speak too much or uh, in an undiplomatic way, uh, we have a number of constraints, and they are listed in the um, UN Code of Conduct for uh, Special Procedures Mandate Holders. In short, it demands from us impartiality, neutrality, and objectivity. The main addressee of my recommendations is and should always be the government of Belarus, which is the main responsible for the implementation of the country's obligations in terms of uh, human rights. However, <clears throat> The position of the government has been um, quite consistent since the creation of the mandate in 2012. It's a policy of non-recognition and non-engagement, meaning that uh, I do not have access to Belarus. It's been four years, I'm not allowed to go there, uh, uh, which makes me, of course, uh, very frustrated. Um, also, we noticed um, a trend uh, for the past two years or one year at least, that the government practices a policy of empty chair in the um, sessions, in the so-called interactive dialogues uh, where I present my reports at the UN in Geneva or in uh, New York. And supposedly we are 
to have a dialogue, a constructive dialogue. And this, in spite of all my efforts, unfortunately, <clears throat> the government is now boycotting these events. Uh, there are no more delegates from, from Belarus or even from like-minded countries, which used to make their statements about uh, human rights being an internal affair and uh, non-interference and uh, these kind of things. So now it's unfortunately more of a monologue and yesterday's sessions was indeed a discussion with countries which do support the mandate because they do care about the situation of human rights uh, in Belarus. Um, in spite of this, um, I still have avenues within the UN system to, uh, to communicate my concerns about the situation. These are, first of all, of course, monitoring and reporting yearly to the UN. Um, the reports I write every year to the General Assembly are uh, thematic, meaning I can choose the topic and I have more freedom to go deeper into the systemic problems for many years that accumulated in one specific field. So for example, the first year uh, after I was appointed, um, I dedicated that report to human rights in the context of electoral processes in, tw in 2019. Uh, the following year and in between were indeed elections which were followed by uh, repression, the topic was the administration of justice because I could foresee that unfortunately if human rights violations would occur in the post-electoral context, they would have little chances given the um, problems with independence of justice and lack of guarantees for a fair trial inside Belarus, there would be little chances for uh, accountability for these crimes. And I was proven right. The following year in 2021, the topic was uh, human rights of women and girls, because we remember from the events of August 2020 that uh, women in particular and political um, uh, activists and, and opposition leaders uh, played uh, an extremely important role and paid a very heavy toll also for trying to defend human rights in the country. And with the same um, priorities in mind, I picked up for this year the topic of human rights of Belarusian nationals compelled to exile, because that's a, a big trend which I develop in the report of people people fleeing the country due to the situation with human rights. Um, I will now share with you some of the takeaways uh, that are contained in, um, in this report. Um, the main one concerns the push factors, uh, meaning that we focused on uh, describing the repression and the climate of fear that uh, prevented, that also prevents a safe return of all these people uh, who, have, uh, who have left. Um, the, um, methodologically, I must remind that um, although we tried, um, I mean, we, my team in, in Geneva and myself, we tried to come up with definite uh, figures. We, for the whole year, we uh, contacted governments of host countries to try and identify to evaluate the, um, the outflow, the, the number of people who did leave the country. But we could not come up with definite uh, numbers or verify them because each country has its own um, rules for counting. Some in, indicated the number of visas they delivered, others. Well, it's, it's quite complicated. And again, not to engage um, the, uh, the UN and into saying it's a half a million or one million, etc. We preferred not to give any uh, figures, so please don't ask me. <laughs> um, also, another choice that was done in order to gather information, and given that I cannot go to, um, to, to Belarus, is uh, to uh, go to other countries, indeed, where people have found um, exile and to conduct interviews directly with uh, people in exile there to understand why they had left and what were the hardships they experienced on, on, on the way. Uh, but for the first time, uh, in order to protect our sources against the risk of retaliation, we decided to pre preserve their anonymity. Usually in reports, we, uh, we do name people with their consent, of course, but in that specific case, even um, naming them could uh, endanger them or their relatives who are still 
in Belarus, many of them in detention. Um, so I'll go in detail into the, the, these uh, push factors and then uh, uh, finish with a number of recommendations and hopefully some practical solutions um, also for the international community in order to uh, limit at least uh, the, uh, the human rights violations that can continue after exile. Um, first, what we have noticed in terms of evolution of trends over the past two years is that um, whereas after the peaceful protests of 2020, many people, 35,000 uh, according to our records have been detained on politically motivated grounds. These were mostly administrative penalties, fines and administrative detention of 15 days or sometimes more, both offline and online. Uh, expressing dissent online has become very dangerous too. And now the, this situation has evolved towards outright criminalization of dissent. And here I've referred to the legislation on extremism and terrorism, which has been tightened and which is being instrumentalized to basically punish um, all dissenters. A second element is that uh, whereas in, initially they were more of harassing individuals with intimidation and threats, now the policy of the government seems to be more um, uh, one of purging the whole civil society this word I have the right to use, a purge. Purging society from the elements which are deemed undesirable. It's a very large uh, number of people. It means uh, lawyers who take up political cases are being disbarred. They lose their licenses. Civil society organizations um, are being dissolved or forced uh, to, to liquidate. More than 600 of them uh, have done so over the past uh, year and a half. There are raids and searches by the fiscal police, uh, tax police, by Gubopik, etc., uh, which uh, means that everybody is living in an atmosphere of fear. A third element is that whereas um, the, in, in August 2020, there were cases of visible political opponents being literally pushed abroad, <laughs> taken to the border and asked to leave the country, of course, the, Famous case in point is Tsikhanovskaya or, or Mrs. Kalesnikova, who refused to be uh, deported to, to Ukraine uh, by tearing, um, tearing out her passport. And, and um, she was, she's been since then in uh, prison. Um, towards now a more deliberate systemic policy encouraging people to leave the country. And here I refer to official statements by the head of state, for example. And faced with two options, either self-censorship or prison, many Belarusians have preventively chosen a third one, the road of exile, sometimes as a precaution against a perceived threat. That's another specificity of the situation we have is that people cannot necessarily say what exactly is the danger for them. Um, they just feel when all your friends or colleagues or members of the same Telegram chat group start having problems, be called for the, by the KGB for a talk, get fired from, from work, be detained, receive threats, etc. You know it is time for you to run away. This is this exactly uh, what uh, some people I interviewed told me. Many left thinking it would be only temporary, uh, that it would, there would be a chance to return. So they left with nothing, basically. Or when they, um, also when you leave, for, for your safety, usually in haste, uh, without knowing what charges are actually brought up against you or will be brought up, criminal or not, in which criminal case are you involved, what is your status, are you a witness or not, it's not never uh, clarified by the uh, judicial authorities. Then once you're in exile, you have no written proof of the repression or the threat. And when you apply, example, for example, for a status as political asylum, for example, or try to justify your status as a victim, you lack this, this documentation, these papers, these proofs. Um, a fourth element, which is extremely worrying, is that whereas in two years ago, um, people were being deterred from protesting through intimidations, mostly, and it worked. Now the policies look more like actual retaliation, as if the government wanted to seek revenge for the 2020 events. 
the authorities embarked in what I see as a witch hunt to punish all those who dared to criticize the government and its policies. And lately also those who criticize the involvement of Belarus in Russia's aggression on Ukraine. As I mentioned, the uh, legislation was, was tightened and instrumentalized to portray dissidents, especially those in exile as dangerous criminals, extremists, terrorists, uh, posing a threat to national security. This was done initially by amending the constitution. I remind that on 27th of February, there was a constitutional referendum. And one point in it was that um, people who receive social benefits in another country or have a document, it can be even Carta Polaca, cannot run for president. So you see who is targeted by these kind of um, amendments. In May, there was an extension of the death penalty to those planning or attempting a terrorist act with aggravating circumstances or in organized groups. So this is um, designed to deter or punish so-called rail partisans, uh, the people who have been sabotaging the supply lines to the Russian troops. Uh, there are already three uh, um, such railway partisans who, uh, who are um, against whom these um, charges of act of terrorism have been uh, raised. And now in preparation are draft laws that would provide for trials to be uh, run in absentia against those people in exile, which would further limit their rights to a fair trial. And also ripping extremists, I quote, in exile from their citizenship, creating possibly a situation of statelessness. And when I he heard this, I tried to find in international law, what is there anything that prevents a government <laughs> from uh, doing such things. And unfortunately, there, there doesn't seem to be. So um, we have to be inventive as well, uh, given how inventive is the government to get rid of the people it doesn't want. And um, all categories are targeted. It's not only the political op opposition, it's civic activists, human rights defenders, of course, most of them now operate from exile, lawyers, cultural workers, media workers, medical staff, academics, etc. Basically, nobody can feel safe. Uh, and relatives are not spared. We see that people who, who, people who we interviewed recalled how concerned they are about their dependent parents or children or other relatives who stayed in Belarus because they too are being threatened or harassed or intimidated. And for example, if their flat gets searched, and a book that is now on the extremist material blacklist is found. Their parents, their elderly parents, who are not even aware of having that book in their child's bedroom, can be held accountable and sent to prison, face criminal charges. Um, also, we received credible reports about punitive raids on the property of people who now live abroad, uh, done by people in plain clothes, uh, but well, we understand who that was. Moving on to the problems that people are facing while in exile. And here again, I must repeat that the main um, um, adresse of my recommendations should be the government. But given the situation, I hope that uh, host countries will also appreciate uh, the recommendations I wish to share with them. Because even though the report focused on the push factors, during interviews, people mentioned issues which I think deserve um, attention. First is, of course, that in spite of the um, terrible situation that many people from the region found themselves in because of the war in Ukraine, uh, Belarusians deserve attention, sort of, they have been on the waiting list for longer. Uh, humanitarian packages are extremely necessary still, and that includes not only medical care, but also psychotherapy. So when uh, this is a recommendation very down to earth that I make when when asked um, that governments should invest now in training future psychologists with knowledge of Russian so that they can be available so that sponsors can pay for them to deliver their services to people in need when they arrive because the needs are there and they will remain. So I commend the generosity and solidarity of many host countries which do offer these humanitarian packages already. Uh, but um, there are obviously others, other countries that could do more. We cannot blame them. It's because simply they are unaware of the problems. It's hard for people who have not lived in the Soviet Union to imagine what Belarusians are going through. 
uh, plus they are facing an inflow of other mi migrants, as, as I said, and they must arbitrate and make difficult choices whom to support, screening applicants takes time and, and resources too. The second priority, I believe, is to the, on the issues of legalization of stays. It's on not only visas, but also delivering permanent residence permits, work permits, associated social benefits for them, for their relatives, dependent relatives. And this requires flexibility because in many cases, Belarusians who run away, as I said, miss simply the necessary papers and proofs, and they cannot turn to their consulate in order to get it. Um, some strategic planning is needed in this sphere because um, humanitarian visas, for example, are delivered for one year. And when they expire, many people who do not know what to do and they still fear returning to Belarus, understandably so, legitimately so. There are huge waiting lines um, because the public administrations of host countries are receiving many demands. They don't have the resources in Belarus, for example, many consulates have uh, limited their, their, their staff there or was expelled. So it takes time to, to process the request. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Belarusian passports have the specificity that they are delivered for a short period, for five years usually. And uh, when a passport expires or when it's full, because all pages have been taken by, by previous visas and stamps for those who used to travel often, uh, renewing this passport is possible by turning to the Belarusian consulate only if one has a permanent residence permit abroad not a temporary one. If you have a temporary one and you go to the consulate, they will say, go back to Minsk and do your passport there and wait for several months. From what I heard, it can take a long time. And people do not feel safe because there's been people who just returned uh, for funerals, for example, and they were uh, detained at the airport. So um, it's understandable that they are afraid of going home. <clears throat> people who went to a country where there is a visa-free regime for Belarusians, like Ukraine or Georgia, and would from then apply for EU visa are also facing problems because not all countries have a working consulate there. Also people who fled the war um, in Ukraine, uh, Ukraine was traditionally a, um, a safe harbor for many Belarusians who left in 2020. Uh, after they had to relocate again from, um, from Ukraine, only those who did already have permanent residence permit in Ukraine were eligible to EU temporary protection in EU countries. All the other uh, Belarusians who could not apply for a humanitarian visa were basically allowed to stay only 14 days, like, like all the African students from Kharkov and, and others whom we hosted here in, in, uh, in, in Warsaw when they left. Um, so I would also want to ask what will happen in case of uh, the Belarusian, in case Belarusian extremists, it's a, no, a znak kachestu, it's a sign of quality I heard from among people in, in exile when they meet um, in, in the host countries. So they, it's almost a pride now to be called an extremist. Uh, what will happen to them if and after the government rips them off their citizenship? This is really something that host governments will have to, uh, to address. And in terms of practical support, and I will stop here, uh, I commend the creation of all the youth hubs, uh, business harbors, media hubs, etc., and the provision of grants, fellowships for students, for artists at risk, for journalists, for, well, after the pandemic, we're all modern digital nomads, and in, luckily for them, many Belarusians can still work, including in the field of human rights, from abroad, but that requires some sponsoring, and, um, and of course, uh, uh, tailored uh, uh, support measures. So this is uh, to be encouraged also in other host countries that are less um, familiar with, this, um, with these hubs as Poland is, uh, luckily. And finally, Belarusians I have been talking to feel the need to reconstitute their communities in exile because they understand that unfortunately they might not be able to return home anytime soon. So that's the spoiler. <laughs> answering the question of, asked uh, by the organizers uh, uh, for, for, for today's event. Um, and that means that um, projects could be uh, designed to support the maintenance of some access to Belarusian culture and language in exile. And here I want to um, uh, give a 
simple example and recommendation, this extremist literature, which is posing a threat to those holding it um, at home in Belarus, is needed for uh, Belarusians in exile who want to recreate a library or a Belarusian speaking school wherever they may be now. So I hope that governments from host countries and sponsors and all the stakeholders will have some imagination on how to get them there. Thank you and I welcome your questions. Uh, Anais, thank you very much for this report. Once again, I uh, urge the participants to write their, their questions in the chat. We'll uh, definitely read them. Uh, meanwhile, I will ask the questions that people uh, sent us during the registration process. One of the questions is about you uh, just mentioned the passports and uh, situation around Belarusian passports. One of the participants is asking, is, are there now or will there be any recommendations for the countries, uh, the governments of the countries, which are not always loyal to Belarusians in exile and who face difficulties there in terms of um, uh, receiving protection. What are the recommendations to the governments of such countries if Belarusians cannot safely go back? Can there be any improvements and changes in their situation? Any specific country, namely, um, because I'm special reporter on Belarus. Um, However, they, I thank uh, all those who have actually submitted inputs on this issue from the can their country of residence uh, to point to some specific problems. Um, again, passport is one of them, but um, the question, unfortunately, since 24th of February of um, bank accounts being um, uh, frozen uh, uh, due to sanctions, or uh, fellowships uh, uh, agreements for students to come and study abroad or these kind of things, attending a conference and, and then not getting the visa in order to travel. All these uh, things have multiplied uh, over the past months and I can only um, invite governments of host countries to really pay attention to the situation in the country to read my report. <laughs> and to consult with uh, the people uh, whom they are hosting their um, civil society organizations in exile, which represent the interests of these, um, of these people in exile, to really listen to what civil society has to say, because um, I, don't, I wouldn't put it in, in terms of loyalty, of course, that's not, probably not the appropriate term, uh, but in terms of uh, solidarity and bearing in mind that um, most the people who are applying for a visa for some flexibility uh, regarding the uh, the legalization of their stay, they are in applying in good faith. They have been suffering human rights violations. They don't want to abuse the system. Um, they may be ignorant of uh, how the system works. I'm thinking about the Schengen rules can be complicated um, for, for many people, um, but they are, uh, I think, legitimate uh, to, 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 get, um, to get some understanding at least and, uh, and good treatment because human rights are international and they, uh, they, are, uh, they apply to everyone. Uh, and once you have hosted somebody, when you, you have a, a, a national on, 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 your, on your territory, uh, you have to comply with human rights uh, um, standards and treat him accordingly. Thank you very much. And uh, we have the first question in the chat. It's in Belarusian. Is there any cooperation with the Belarusian uh, state bodies through the United Nations channel? What are the questions raised there and solved there, if any? 
Um, it's an important question. As I mentioned uh, in the beginning, unfortunately, the government uh, maintains its policy of non-recognition and non-cooperation. Um, so uh, I've been trying through formal and informal uh, channels to um, get somebody to talk to, but nobody was interested even in replying. Um, the only, um, I could think of two channels which, uh, which remain the uh, the main one is not through me. It's uh, in the framework of so-called universal periodic review, and this is a mechanism of the Human Rights Council, which operates between states. So each state is a sort of as a peer, is allowed to make recommendations to another state on solving some issues. And this is one recommendation I make to governments um, that care. Uh, follow up with the recommendations you sent to Belarus through the UPR uh, the, during the last cycle of this universal periodic review, um, the government in fact accepted some recommendations from some friendly states, but on the same topic that are that are um, unpleasant on, on the issue of uh, death penalty or women's rights and things like this or more. And uh, it's important that, that governments not only suggest these uh, imp improvements and these um, um, reforms, but also offer their help, and this is what I could do if, if the government wanted to collaborate with me, offer their help in uh, practically finding solutions. Because if the government has showed, I have not seen, but if it did show at some point some willingness to do some improvements, maybe it will need some guidance as well as to how to implement what kind of um, improvements in order to comply with its international obligations. The second channel um, is the one we use at special procedures. It's called communications. Um, it's, uh, or allegation letters. It's uh, letters that we sent to the government. I do that with, um, on specific cases, the cases, individual cases that are reported to me either through victims of human rights violations or through their representatives, their lawyers, or through human rights defenders. Um, and I've been using that instrument a lot. We issue at least one such allegation letter per month, and that's a lot of work, and there's a lot of red tape and, and uh, in, in the UN system to, to get these uh, sent. Um, I have, because I have to, um, get the support and the signature of thematic mandate holders, special rapporteur on human rights defenders, on uh, the right to freedom of expression, the right to freedom of peaceful assembly, etc., or uh, the prevention of torture, in order for to get an answer. Because when I write alone, then the government doesn't even reply. When uh, we write together, uh, then the government replies to them, not to me, but to the others, thematic mandate holders that it does recognize. And um, what we noticed over the past year is that they, oh, the government also stopped answering these letters. Not that they would have had any significant impact in the past uh, because we were raising you know, attention on specific cases. Do you know this guy is being uh, um, arbitrarily detained, what are you doing to guarantee his rights, etc. They would not liberate that person because of our letter. But um, at least I think there was a pedagogical um, um, benefit to this because in we, we recall the events, uh, the allegations, we don't prejudge if they are true or not, we say this is what was called, uh, brought to our attention. And if this is true, well, bear in mind that there is this and this and this existing conventions that you signed that applied and that well we don't say you are violating but basically we remind them very clearly what are the uh, the standards and the articles of this or that convention that they should um, comply with in order to address this issue and at least this document this list of documents goes through through the MFA and through relevant uh, administ public administrations in Belarus when they used to prepare an answer to say we don't violate that convention. Um, at least it meant that somebody was reading these um, these conventions because I'm pretty sure that they are not taught, they're not even mentioned in the uh, during the course of education for, for judges, for example. They're not encouraged to know uh, what international conventions do apply. 
And uh, now the, the policy seems to be just to ignore these letters altogether and not even reply to them, uh, which, which is a pity, of course. And uh, yes, I will stop here, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you very much. And the next question, the government of Belarus uh, has announced its intention to denounce uh, the optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Can you comment on this? What will be the uh, consequences of the Belarusian government in case they, uh, they do this? I think it's, a, it's indeed a very important um, issue, very worrying trend. Uh, so I was not allowed to comment on, on it until actually the, the law was, um, was um, adopted uh, just recently. And consequently, the Human Rights Committee, which is the treaty body that um, monitors the implementation by states of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, made its own comment on the issue. And they did write to the government to express uh, their concern, because in, if this law is uh, signed by the president and enters into force, it means that Belarus will deprive itself of a um, key instrument uh, for uh, respecting human rights in the sense that the protocol provides for individuals to uh, send petitions to the committee and ask for um, decisions to be issued on specific cases when they claim their rights under the, um, the um, covenant, this ICCPR have been violated and uh, there was no possibility for redress inside through the national uh, system. And um, from what I understood, the committee will uh, do its best to convince the government not to uh, denounce the protocol, but I think it's unfortunately it's now a, um, a priority uh, policy for them to achieve this and um, I mean for the government. And they will also uh, keep addressing the um, the uh, petitions that will be sent to them for at least a year, uh, because it takes time for this to take effect. I mean, this denunciation. Uh, there are a few precedents. Uh, Jamaica uh, left the the protocol, denounced the protocol as well. Um, but uh, for the committee members, for the experts sitting in that committee, it's uh, of course problematic because they have a uh, quite a number of pending cases. It takes a long time to, to examine uh, these cases. And Belarus is uh, among the top uh, countries in terms of submissions, which shows the problems with the administration of justice inside the country. And also the, uh, the level of education of Belarusians who know about human rights and who know about the existence of this mechanism to, um, to, to, uh, in order to get internationally uh, a chance for redress that they don't get uh, at the level of uh, national uh, jurisdiction. Thank you very much. And uh, the next question. It is about uh, the diaspora in Belarus. Is there any cooperation between the UN and the representatives of the Polish diaspora in Belarus? Is there any news ab about the arrested Polish activists? Is the United Nations trying to help their case uh, due to the high level of repression uh, towards the Polish diaspora? Is there any special cooperation uh, with the Polish diaspora when, uh, when we talk about the, them returning to Belarus? Not allowed to speak in the name of the UN. I'm not a UN representative. I'm an independent expert uh, tasked with monitoring the situation of human rights in Belarus. And of course, the uh, situation of the Polish speaking minority in uh, Belarus has been a recurrent issue. And we have actually sent uh, allegation letters on this uh, regarding numerous uh, individuals, but also trends that we observe, such as the closing down of um, Polish speaking schools. Um, the um, the detention the uh, of uh, journalists 
and therefore uh, we as special procedures are paying attention to this and I hear that the Polish government is uh, drawing attention to this in all possible uh, fora of the uh, of the UN how the UN cooperates and and uh, reacts on this I cannot say but uh, in my capacity as special rapporteur as long as um, you know I can um, cross uh, cross check and verify the allegations. I'm ready to take action on um, on the issues uh, which are which are raised if they indeed violate um, in the international uh, um, obligations uh, conventions that uh, that uh, Belarus is a party of. Thank you very much, Anais. Now I'll read out the questions that we received during the registration process. The threat of uh, prison terms for participation in peaceful demonstration, online commentary. Are these factors in, important enough while assessing the uh, asylum seekers' applications? Can it, they be considered um, the ground for this asylum? Um, I understand the question, uh, but again, uh, I'm, I'm not entitled to, uh, to um, substitute those who do consider these uh, asylum requests. Um, Belarusians in exile who fled to, to seek safety in, in any country have the right to seek asylum and have their and the right to have their claims individually determined by the receiving states. That's, uh, that's just a, an obligation for host countries. Um, and international refugee law does provide um, a protection against persecution, including on politically motivated ground or, or what would endanger the life or the personal freedom of uh, the person. And that is why there is also a principle of uh, um, that, that people who have who are in exile, who are seeking asylum because uh, for fear of being persecuted if they can come back to their country, um, they have uh, the right to, it's a fundamental right, not to be forcibly returned, this notion of refoulement, uh, to a country where his or her life, liberty or physical security may be threatened. As I mentioned in my introductory speech, assessing this level of, thre of threat is is a subjective thing, and I cannot do that. I have to be objective. Um, and uh, it's up to each state to determine on, um, on what grounds uh, they would grant or not ASLIM. What my role is, is to uh, again repeat that the human rights violations in Belarus are real, that people who um, express their discontent or criticism online are as much threatened as anybody who participated in, um, in a, a peaceful protest. And it's not because we don't have the uh, uh, media, uh, you know, like when there was this TV coverage or, or through, through um, uh, YouTube channels and, and when journalists were in the streets, were not in prison, were in the streets and able to, to, to shoot videos of how people were being arrested violently, brutally uh, by, by people in plain clothes all through the second half of 2020 in the streets of Minsk. For the rest of the world, it looked credible. It looked, it, it sounded there's something going on that is a real uh, uh, violation of the right to freedom of peaceful assembly when it's um, the uh, creator or administrator of a Telegram chat, and many of them have been created um, since the pandemic, in fact, not, not, not necessarily after the elections, but really before that, when the, the state was not really um, meeting the demands and needs of uh, the population facing uh, COVID uh, starting in, in February, March, 2020, people started organizing themselves horizontally. And this is when these telegram chats appeared to, uh, to help medics to provide masks and, and uh, to inform one another about the fact that there is, um, there is a hotspot of infections in one place or another, stay home, and these kind of things. Um, and imagine that today, any um, 
moderator, administrator, creator of a Telegram chat, which is seen as extremist, which is labeled as extremist, and it can be courtyard chats um, or people talking about how to get letters to people who are uh, arbitrarily detained and these kind of things, or defending just their human rights. But that person can be prosecuted for extremism, for organizing um, uh, extremist activities and indeed uh, face criminal prosecution. So it really doesn't matter if it's online or offline. What is important is um, to, um, to uh, remember that, the, uh, that uh, anyone can be exposed and the um, means used to identify a person and to um, identify all those who are in this the extremist network are really mean. Uh, so that's why people, when they are threatened like this, they uh, they have just one minute when there is a raid, when there is a search, people knocking at their door at six in the morning, they have just a few minutes to, to destroy the evidence, to send a, a, a warning message, uh, uh, unsubscribe from my channel uh, in order to protect the others, because if they don't, they are threatened. People, they can receive such kind of threats. You will lose your children. You, your children will be seized uh, by the state. You're not put under be put under the protection of the state if you don't cooperate. So give us your uh, pin code, and we enter your your mobile phone. And then once they are inside the mobile phone, they can identify all the members of the network of the Telegram chat. So these kind of things have to be known so that governments of uh, countries that receive this asylum. Uh, requests can themselves appreciate the level of threat that exists for people who try to uh, use claim their their uh, right to uh, freedom of expression in the autos. Uh, Thank you very much, Anais. I think we have a little bit of time. Colleagues, if you have some questions, commentaries, remarks, feel free to use this opportunity and ask them. Meanwhile, I'll uh, read out then one of the last questions. It may be quite provocative, maybe philosophical in nature, but uh, anyway, I'll read it out. And uh, you may or may not answer it if you would like. Don't you think that the United Nations cannot influence in any way the, the fact that Belarusians will be able, the possibility of Belarusians to safely return to their mother? country soon? Um, well, it's a, it's a moral question more than a philosophical one. Uh, I think everyone uh, should have the right to live in the country of his or her choice. Uh, it's it's a fundamental right. Um, but uh, the, and, and again, um, you know, the limitations of, of the UN itself, uh, there it's, it's, a multi, it, it's an intergovernmental organization. And uh, therefore, it's only the reflection of what states make of it. And from what I can see, the um, those that do respect uh, human rights, uh, the, the very conventions that they have drafted and signed um, are a minority. So uh, in these uh, circumstances, it's uh, hard, I believe, for the uh, UN to influence uh, much uh, individual governments. Um, the case of Belarus has been very high on the agenda of the Human Rights Council for many years. So I believe that there is still uh, hope that um, some progress can be achieved through the mechanisms that exist. And here I would like to recall that there is actually um, another, um, a second mandate, which uh, is different from mine, that was established by a resolution of the Human Rights Council in March 2021. Uh, it's called the um, OEB, standing for OHCHR Examination of Belarus. OHCHR is uh, the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights. And so the High Commissioner was tasked by the Human Rights Council uh, to uh, implement this so-called accountability mechanism. So it's not um, a commission of inquiry uh, into the violations that were committed in the framework of the 2020 uh, elections. It's uh, only an examination of Belarus, but the idea is the same, is to gather evidence of um, uh, human rights violations, to verify them, to safe 
safely uh, uh, put them in a safe deposit, and that includes based on the interviews that were gathered by um, by the team, by the experts who work within that mechanism, and I'm supporting them uh, by providing the information I have that was submitted to me directly by victims uh, on, on my phone, basically in in 2020. Um, and according to the resolution, the, the High Commissioner is also, uh, so with our support, with the support of, of independent experts, uh, she's also, he now, is um, uh, supposed to work towards um, accountability, meaning uh, redress for uh, the victims and also identifying the perpetrators. So this, at some point, can be made available for whoever will prosecute the um, human rights violations that have been committed. And here I'm thinking in particular about the most serious ones, uh, such as acts of torture uh, and forced disappearances, um, extrajudicial executions, things that apparently have taken place in 2020. And um, it can be when there will be an independent uh, uh, judiciary uh, in Belarus, uh, they could uh, adjudicate these cases based on all this evidence that uh, is being gathered by, by the OEB. Uh, it can be at some uh, other level, um, an ad hoc tribunal, uh, which, well, Belarus is not a uh, um, uh, Part to the uh, to the um, international criminal court, so that's that's probably not an, an avenue. But uh, in the meantime, there are also tribunals. There are also countries that do recognize uh, the uh, so-called universal jurisdiction of their uh, national uh, justice system for adjudicating uh, crimes that could amount to crimes against humanity, the most serious crimes. And or, or genocide or these these kind of crimes, and um, therefore the fact that people in exile might actually be uh, well because they are victims of human rights violations or were witnessed of it witnesses, they are in if they are in countries which do uh, recognize the universal jurisdiction, then it means that these judges these prosecutors have at hand available people who can testify of what they have. Um, gone through. Another problem is, of course, uh, to give a chance to uh, the defense to uh, defend itself. And here we're talking about the perpetrators who are um, uh, safely uh, in, in, in Belarus, because uh, I argue they are under the protection of, uh, of, of the government, of the, of the authorities. Uh, plus, they might be also on, on the visa ban list and uh, no risk that they would uh, travel in the country where they could be uh, held accountable. So it shows the possibilities and the limits, of course. But one, one thing I'm certain of is that um, in the meantime, before their accountability is activated and uh, perpetrators start feeling uh, the pressure, the risk for themselves, um, they will unfortunately not stop committing human rights violations because unfortunately it's systematic, it's systemic in Belarus and um, they, they feel they can do it with uh, absolute impunity. Uh, thank you Anais for this comprehensive reply. In our chat, we have four more questions. And please let me know how much time we have so that I could understand whether we'll be able to read them out. I will select one or two. So shall we uh, ask uh, uh, read out one or two questions or four of them. All the questions are in the chat. You can select the one you're ready to answer. To. Um, so um, the, the question by Erasmus Olsen uh, is outside the scope of my mandate indeed. 
um, because, uh, well, a declaration of war of national liberation, of national liberation of whom against whom. Anyway, if it has anything to do with the uh, with the conflict in in Ukraine, uh, it's not my field of competence. Uh, basically, there is uh, there are other mechanisms in in, in the UN. Uh, so it's indeed uh, too provocative. Um, Alan Flowers, uh, glad to see you here. Um, the question you raise about, has your study considered issues? Right? Well, as I mentioned in answer to another question earlier, there are um, things about uh, loyalty or being unsympathetic. It's, it's, uh, it's a bit subjective, but um, it's the prerogative of any state to uh, examine according to its own legislation, the um, demands for ASLIM or for any kind of other protection or, or resident permit that is submitted by a, a Belarusian uh, person in exile. So, well, here I, I cannot really comment on this. Uh, the only thing, again, I will repeat is that their uh, um, allegations are usually genuine, that uh, it, it, they left most of them for a good reason. Those who could leave for other reasons, the, some IT personnel, for example, left Belarus because uh, it was impossible to do business anymore there, especially after um, the, the start of the war in Ukraine and all the difficulties with, in, with the SWIFT system and etc. Uh, but they also had the means to, to um, start a new life, to get a, um, a job invitation from a potential employer or from their existing employer to go and move to another country to continue their work. So I wouldn't say that they are um, victims of human rights violations, but I don't think they would either uh, apply for asylum status because it's usually not very beneficial status. I mean, you, usually you cannot work uh, while while um, your application is pending. So um, these are are uh, specific cases, and each individual cases has to be uh, examined by by the relevant um, authorities. And uh, in the meantime, I think it's just important to uh, make sure that um, no more abuses, that, 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 that victims of human rights violations are not uh, re-victimized uh, and, and uh, suffer more from other kind of violations. And unfortunately, we hear about those kind of things as well. Um, some Belarusians are um, victims of discrimination or hate speech especially since February 2020, where in some countries, uh, some people identify uh, Belarusians altogether as part of the um, aggression. So it's, again, it's another topic, but um, um, hate speech is forbidden in general, and, and therefore states have the responsibility to, uh, to make sure that uh, it doesn't uh, happen in their, in, in their countries and that the, the victims of hate speech are protected. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say. And then uh, please translate for me the, uh, the question in Belarusian, Natalia. I can read it, but... Mm -hmm. uh, ah, about children. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is about the rights of uh, the children of Belarusians who left the country together with their parents. In Belarus, uh, such children are uh, uh, looked for by the by the police. The police uh, turns to the relatives of such children. They say that uh, uh, these children are wanted, criminally wanted. Can they, can uh, they be searched for outside Belarus? What could be the consequences and procedures in this respect? First, I want to remind that uh, in terms of international human rights law, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child applies to any uh, individual up until 18 years old. Uh, one is considered a child until 18 years old. So there is indeed, uh, there are indeed several problems, which I highlighted in previous reports about the situation of some teenagers uh, in, in Belarus, uh, young people who have... Um, exercised uh, for well, well who have ended up in a situation where they are being criminally prosecuted 
Uh, this includes uh, people, young people who did take part in the peaceful protests or otherwise exercise their freedom of expression by uh, coloring their hair or uh, uh, in, in uh, forbidden white and white, red, white colors or these kind of things. Um, and um, the, the fact that they would be now uh, searched for uh, by, the, uh, by the, the authorities of Belarus sounds to me extremely uh, cynical. And of course, their status demands immediate and, and, and serious um, attention uh, because one should remember also, and I wrote about this in my report to the General Assembly in, in 2020, uh, um, the administration of justice in, in Belarus uh, is, uh, has significant failures, especially when it comes to uh, the um, uh, justice for the minors. And uh, there is no actually a, a, a specific juvenile justice system. So the rights of the child, uh, which are more than the simple human rights, this thing, his human rights are guaranteed, but they're even more because of his vulnerability as a child. Uh, so unfortunately, the, 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 the rights of that individual would definitely risk um, uh, not being respected if the uh, child was uh, returned. Um, and um, there have been, serious uh, um, infringements on the uh, right uh, on the convention on the rights of the child in uh, in, in Belarus um, and uh, this of course is is a, a matter of uh, of concern so I think they do indeed deserve um, you know special protection uh, in exile thank you very much Ms. Marin, think maybe you could uh, leave your contact information, working uh, official contact information for the journalist that they could use to contact you and ask some clarif clarifying questions, including uh, related to those related to the report. And I think we're actually out of time. If you have some more time, we can read out one more questions. If we're out of time, then we, we can finalize our session. Please let me know. How would you like to proceed? Well, I've seen this question by Irina Kretyakova. Belarus также с родителями покинули подростки, подлежащие призыву на службу. Что в перспективе таких детей? Какая защита может быть у совершеннолетних? Well, this is getting a bit specific, but um, in, from an international human rights law perspective, uh, freedom of conscience includes the freedom of um, refusing to uh, to serve under the flag and uh, or find some alternative to uh, uh, military service and uh, that includes of course the right to refuse to um, to um, wear and use arms weapons so uh, that's the only thing I can say uh, at, at from, from my perspective, uh, this is the fundamental right, and therefore, whether it's uh, um, the individual is um, minor or uh, already 18, past 18 years old, and whether he is in, uh, in Belarus still or has run away for fear that his right um, be uh, violated, uh, well, that's, uh, that's already, again, falls ag and under the general frame of this uh, people being compelled to exile because their fundamental human rights are being violated uh, in Belarus proper. There's some clarification about uh, yes. can they be executed? Um, well, there are plenty of, uh, in my view, people who are in fact victims of human rights violations or who are innocent of what they are being accused of, uh, who are in exile because they uh, would otherwise face uh, criminal prosecution. And the only thing I can say is that uh, I hope that the host countries are aware of uh, the situation and of the fact that if they would agree to a request for um, um, deportation is not the right word, sorry, in English, um, for extradition of a so-called criminal uh, back to Belarus, they would know that there is a 
higher even uh, um, principle of international human rights law is that you don't return a person whom you know might be subject to a violation of human rights, including the risk of uh, torture or ill treatment. So based on this, uh, I hope that um, if such um, if criminal cases are pending against the uh, Rifuznik who are, went into exile, I hope that the host countries will indeed refrain from returning them to Belarus. We have one more question in the chat from Ms. Uh, Mr. Rasmus Olsen. If we have two more minutes, we can answer this question. If not, we'll close today's session. The uh, the question from Rasmus Olsen. Uh, there have been allegations uh, we received of uh, indeed crimes uh, being committed. Um, so it was allegations of rapes uh, by um, uh, Russian soldiers, uh, and it was unfortunately impossible to verify the allegations. And from what we understood, uh, the victims. Uh, at some point felt they could not uh, move on with providing evidence or signing the consent form for us to act. But I understand also that they were not um, willing or able to uh, seek uh, um, accountability and redress within their own system uh, in, in, in Belarus in, in courts. But I would say that unfortunately here it goes way beyond the Belarusian case, and it's very often that victims, women victims of rape, uh, uh, are being denied a right to, to, to justice simply because uh, policemen do not take their testimonies. So uh, this is all what I can say, and it has nothing to do with uh, who was the perpetrator and what country he was from and whether he was in civilian or not. Want to send for media who would want to send a media request? Uh, I will add my email here in the chat. Um, please don't abuse it, it's, it's my work mail. Um, <clears throat> and um, I'll be happy to answer specific um, media requests if I have time. Again, it's a job I do in my free time, so. Um, uh, distinguished participants and the speaker, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, I would like to thank you for ask, asking questions, for joining us, for finding time to do this. We are closing our session and we Let's keep in touch. Thank you very much again. Thank you and goodbye.